This morning we will follow setting one of the service. If you'd like to follow in the hymnal, it's on page 154. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. <coughs> Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by virtue, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally inherit eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May we see you. Thank <laughs> you. 
This fifth Sunday in Lent has sometimes been called Little Easter because of its references to the power of Jesus over death and the power of Jesus to restore us to life. And so we see that power in this first lesson from 2 Kings chapter 4. There was a woman who had received the precious gift of a child and yet it appeared that God took that child away from her and yet by the power of God he was restored to her. But the woman conceived and gave birth to a son at that same time of the year, just as Elisha said to her. The boy grew up, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. Then he said to his father, My head, my head. His father said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. So they picked him up and carried him to his mother. And the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. Then she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. She shut the door behind her and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, Send one of the servants to me with one of the donkeys so that I can run to the man of God and come back. He said, Why are you going to him today? It's not the new moon and it's not the Sabbath. But she said, It's all right. Then she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead the way. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her from a distance, he said to her servant Gehazi, Look, that's the woman from Shunem. Now run to meet her and say, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your son all right? She answered, We're all right. Then she came to the man of God at the mountain and she grasped his feet. Gehazi stepped forward to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for her soul is in distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me. He has not told me. Then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Didn't I say, Don't give me false hope? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, Hike up your garments for travel and take my staff in your hand and go. If you meet someone, do not greet him. And if someone greets you, do not answer. Put my staff on the boy's face. But the boy's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went ahead of them and put the staff on the boy's face. But there was no sound, and there was no response. So he went back to Elisha and told him the boy did not wake up. Then Elisha came to the house where the boy was, dead, lying on his bed. So he went in and shut the door behind the two of them. Then he prayed to the Lord. He got up and lay down on top of the boy. He put his mouth to the boy's mouth, his eyes to the boy's eyes, his palms to the boy's palms. Then he bent down over him and the boy's flesh became warm. He went back into the house and paced back and forth. Then he went up and bent over him and the boy sneezed seven times. Then the boy opened his eyes. Then Elisha called to Gehazi and said, Call the woman of Shunem. <coughs> So he called her and she came in and he said, Pick up your son. So she came in and fell at Elisha's feet and bowed down to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today, Psalm 73, we'll hear the refrain, sing the refrain and read responsibly. <laughs> the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. heaven but you. And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, 
and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This lesson today is written in the 8th chapter of, of Paul's letter to the Romans. And in this lesson, Paul talks about how we are children of God. How we have a place in his home, in heaven. And how the Lord comes to us and assures us always that we are his children. And if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will also make your mortal bodies alive through his spirit who is dwelling in you. So then, brothers, we do not owe it to the sinful flesh to live in harmony with it. For if you live in harmony with the sinful flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery so that you were afraid again, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we call out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins our spirit and testifying that we are God's children. Now if we are children, we also are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. For I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. In fact, creation is waiting with eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us rise for the gospel acclamation. If you're following in the hymnal on page 161, the, the acclamation for Lent is at the bottom of the page. This morning is written in St. John's Gospel, chapter 11. Um, here's an incident that occurred three or four months before Jesus died and rose again. Um, he showed his power over death by bringing Lazarus, Lazarus back to life. When, he arri when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him while Mary was sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even if he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never perish. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Jesus was deeply moved again as he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Take the stone away, he said. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor because it's been four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took the stone, they took away the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The man who had died came out with his feet and his hands bound with strips of linen and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus told them, 
loose him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what Jesus did believed on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. We will sing our next hymn. mercy and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus. Amen. The word of God that we look at today is our epistle lesson from Romans 8. Let me read a little bit of that again. Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery so that you are afraid again, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we call out Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Dear friends in Christ, welcome to the family. At what time are we most likely to hear someone say that to us? To give you some more clues so that you may think what I'm thinking, um, let me say a few more things. We're not Losing a son, we're gaining a daughter. Or, I never had a sister, and I feel like you're the sister I never had. Or, whether you want to be a part of this family or not, welcome to the family. When are we likely to hear stuff like that? Wedding posts, right? At a wedding dinner. It's kind of a given. If the parents of the bride or the groom get up, or a brother or sister get up, they have to say, welcome to the family somewhere in their toast, in their speech, which is only fitting and only the right thing to say, right? Because in a wedding, then this person becomes a part of the family and they want that person to feel welcome and be a part of the family. So that's what they say in the toast. I think most of you know we have four kids. All of, them are, all of them are married. And so we have welcomed four people into our family. I think for the most part, they're happy to be in our family, although there have been some things that have been different. For example, you've heard of the Midwestern goodbye, right? Midwestern, Midwestern goodbye, you're sitting, you're visiting, and then you say, oh, I think it's about time for us to get going, but then you sit and talk for another 20 minutes, and then finally 20 minutes later you say, well, I think we should get going, and then you, you get up and you kind of move to the door, and then you stand by the door for another 10 minutes, and then you go out to your car and you stand there for another 15 minutes and talk. So from the time you said, I think we should get going, to actually driving away is like 45 minutes. Well, our family has that down to a science. Some of these other newcomers to our family didn't grow up in a family like that, and so it was a bit of an adjustment for them to be a part of this family. That's just one example. 
In our text today, the Apostle Paul talks about how we are welcomed into the family of God. Not by marriage, he says, but by adoption. And this has been a huge adjustment for us to be a part of God's family. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. For being a part of God's family brings many blessings to us and brings us great assurance. And so that's our theme for today as we want to work through these verses from Romans chapter 8. God says to us, welcome to my family. First of all, because this brings us security. Secondly, it brings us anticipation. Thirdly, it brings us obligation. So welcome to the family. What family were we in before we became a part of God's family? Well, we were in the family of the devil, right? And so Paul says in our text, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery, so that you are afraid again. So in, when we were in the family of the devil, it was not a family where there's a, a father and children, a family of love and support, but instead it's a family of master slavery, threats, fear, punishment. This is the family that we were in before. Now, a lot of people who aren't Christians don't want to be in the family of God because they look at all the, the laws and the works and they think, well, I don't want to be a part of that. I want to live free. I want to be free to do whatever I want. That's a lie and a delusion of the devil, isn't it? Because the devil tries to keep these people trapped. Trapped in their sin, in addiction to sin, trying to keep them trapped in sinning over and over again. The devil tries to keep them trapped with fear. He says, you're not a slave again to fear. Fear of getting caught. Fear of getting punished. Fear of not being good enough. Fear of being alone. Fear of not being welcomed into the family. All that fear is part of that old family of the devil. So now we're in a new family. God has welcomed us into a new family. How is it even possible? Because he gave us his only son. God was willing to give up his son Jesus to come down here. Jesus took upon himself the sins of the world, went to the cross, paid for them, rose again so that we could have forgiveness and eternal life. Then God gave us his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit brought us to faith. So now we are adopted into God's family through baptism, through being brought to faith. And now we have a part of this wonderful family of God. To help us um, kind of appreciate this or impress upon us what this means, let's uh, consider as an example like a, a generic classic orphan movie. Okay, like the orphan Annie or 20 years ago there was this basketball movie like Mike where this guy lived in an orphanage and then he got basketball shoes. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. But So here is a little girl living in an orphanage with a whole bunch of other kids. The people who are running the orphanage don't care about the kids. They're only in it for the money. They don't give the children love. They only give them threats and punishment and fear. You better do this or you better do that or else you will be in trouble. And this little girl wonders. She dreams, will I ever have a family? Will I ever be good enough? Will I ever be pretty enough? Because every month or so, prospective kids parents come and they walk through the, the orphanage and she wonders, will I get picked? Will people want me in their family? So this here is the part of being in the family of the devil. He wants to keep his orphans trapped, his little orphans trapped in his family. He does that by saying one of two things. He says to them, you're the greatest, you're the best, you can do whatever you want, you don't need anyone to help you, you can do it all. Then, when they mess up, which we all do, then he says, look at what a mess you are. No one will ever want you. No one will give you love. No one will want you to be a part of their family. You're not pretty enough. You're not good enough. Well, one day the little girl gets adopted. Some parents come. They take her home. And they adopt her to be their own child, and they love her with an unconditional love. But it's hard for her, this, this unconditional love that they are pouring out on her still, she still wonders and thinks to herself, 
am I pretty enough to be a part of this family? Am I good enough to be here? And they, they always give her a hug. They're so quick to say, yes, you are a part of our family now. We love you no matter what. You're ours. And so, this is what God says to us. He has made us a part of his family through adoption. And sometimes there's a part of us that says, really? Am I really good enough to be here? Am I really pretty enough to be here? But God says, yes. You have a place in my family. And when we have these doubts, we need to keep in mind that our feelings, whether good or bad, our feelings that we're not enough will not make our place in God's family any less secure. Our place in God's family is not here because we were pretty or because we did good. It's just because he loved us. He adopted us as his own, just purely out of love. That's it. Nothing in us. And so when we have those doubts, then the Holy Spirit comes to us and he says, and let me back up a little bit here, you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we call out Abba Father. And then he says the spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. When we hear his word, the Holy Spirit says to us, you are my child. You have a place in my family no matter what. When we receive his body and his blood, the Lord impresses on us, you are my child. I gave this for you so that you can be mine. What a blessing to be in God's family and have that peace and security. There's also anticipation. So let's go back to this little girl. Let's give her a name. Huh? We'll call her Sally. Sally is enjoying her place. In the family, she now has her own room. She has her own clothes. If there's anything she needs, her parents will be quick to, to take care of it for her. But it's not about the stuff that makes her feel good. It's that she is loved and she has a place in this family. One day, let's say it's middle of winter, January, her parents call a family meeting. And you can tell it's good news because they're all excited and they say we're when August comes, the last week in August, we're going to Disney World. So exciting. Actually, these parents have three other children, birth children, and then they adopted Sally. And so Sally just can't help it. She still says to them, me too. I get to go along too. And they give her a hug and they say, of course you're going along. You're a part of this family now. And all the other kids are so excited to share with her because they've been there three years ago. They're so excited to tell her all the wonderful things she's going to see. And it's beyond her wildest dreams that she would ever get to Disney World. And August seems a long way off, but time flies and she gets more and more excited as time goes along. So the Lord comes to us and says, I have arranged a trip for you. Because you are in my family, you get to go to heaven. And there's a part of us that says, really? I get to go. He says, now we are children of God. If we are children of God, we are also heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ since we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Since we're in the family, Paul says, we will inherit heaven. God has that waiting for us because we're his. And Paul talks about how exciting and awesome that's going to be, beyond what we can imagine. He says, for I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. In fact, creation is waiting with eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. And so, Paul compares this life and the troubles of this life, and we could look at all our troubles and all our anxieties and worries, and we could pile them up in one pile, and how does that compare to heaven? Can it even match up? Paul says you take the glory of heaven and it just supersedes and covers over this pile of troubles because heaven is going to be so much more. He says there's not even a comparison of the glory we have compared to the troubles that we have now is just beyond what we can imagine. Has anybody ever been there to tell us what it's like in heaven? 
Some people have claimed that they've been there and then come back. Is that true? Some of them have written books we can't say for sure. But we can say that this same Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this in Romans, also wrote this in 2 Corinthians. I know a man in Christ, here he's talking about himself, he's being humble. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was carried up to the third heaven. Whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows. And I know that such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was carried up to paradise and heard inexpressible words that man cannot possibly speak. Paul says, I got to go there. I don't know whether in the body or out of it, but he says, I can't even put into words how wonderful and awesome it is to be there. And in fact, here in verse 19, he says, even creation, even the hills and the mountains and the rivers and the trees are eagerly waiting for heaven to come. So sometimes heaven seems a long way off. And we don't know when it will be for us, but the closer we get to the end, the more excited we get. And it's just so exciting to think about what we have waiting for us, and it's ours, because we're in the family of God. Being in the family of God is the security and anticipation of what is to come. Also an obligation. So after the, going back to Sally, after that meeting, we're going to Disney World, her parents say to Sally, you know, we want to talk to you about something, can you stay here a minute? And she's like, there it is. Here comes the bad news, I wonder what it's going to be. And they say to her, Sally, you've been a part of this family for a while now. And we think it's about time that you pitched in and we'd like to have you do some chores. So there's never been a little girl who was so excited to wash dishes, to vacuum, and to clean. Yes, they're chores that nobody likes to do, but she's excited because now, just like everyone else, she has chores to pitch in and help. Now, just like everyone else, she can do something to let her parents know just what they mean for her. And yet she's a little nervous. She says, what if I don't do it right? And they kind of chuckle and they say, you know, it's all right. We forgive you. If you drop a class, we're not going to send you back to the orphanage. We love you and we forgive you. And so now God comes to us and he says, you're in my family. I still want you to follow my word and obey my commandments. And people who are not Christians go, there it is. That's why I don't want to be a believer, because there's all those rules. But they don't really understand what it is to be in the family. And all the blessings of being in the family. And how we want to follow those rules then. And, and God doesn't hold anybody hostage. If people want to go back to their sin, if they want to live in sin and continue in sin without repenting, if they want to give up their faith, he says, you can do that, but you will die. So then, brothers, we do not owe it to the sinful nature to live in harmony with it, but if you live in harmony with the sinful flesh, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. And so now, as a part of God's family, we're anxious and happy to pitch in, to do chores, to follow his commandments, because it means we have a chance to say thank you to God for everything he's given to us. But what if we mess up? And we will, right? God says, I still forgive you. I'm not going to kick you out of the family just because you mess up. You have a place here forever in this family and I will love you and I'm going to take you to be in heaven with me. That's the blessing of being a child of God. So some families we would love to be a part of, right? Like the Brady Bunch. Wouldn't that be cool? Or June and Ward Cleaver, like the Beeve and Wally. Or maybe a Danny Tanner and his full house of kids. We'd love to be in part of those families. The Adams family, not so much. We maybe wouldn't want to be in that family. Family of God, nothing better. Because we're a part of that family. By love, we're adopted into that family. Forgiven, chosen, going to heaven. <coughs> The 
peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We join in confessing our faith. We'll use the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This time we will pray in our prayers this morning. We include a prayer on behalf of Kelsey Lentz, who had surgery this week. Also, Terry Zick, who had been in the hospital, is now in the resident home recovering. So we pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, accept our humble thanks for becoming one of us, that as the word become flesh, you might fulfill all that was necessary for our eternal redemption. You were tempted by Satan and found faithful, and now your perfect obedience to God's will is credited to us. Bearing our sins, you willingly went the agonizing way of the cross, where God laid on you the iniquity of us all. And so the law has been kept, and the price of sin has been paid. Govern our lives by the cross, so that beholding the suffering you endured for our sins, we will learn more and more to hate sin and love righteousness, through that message of mercy and forgiveness through the cross, strengthen, cheer, and guide us all of our days. And dear Savior, may we ever stand before your cross, filled with the wonderment at the love you showed for us there. And in our dying hour, keep us near your cross, where alone forgiveness and life and salvation can be found. Give us a blessed death, that we may enter into your eternal presence, and there receive joy and glory. And Heavenly Father, who hears and answers all prayers, we thank you that you have heeded the prayers of Kelsey and that you have made her surgery successful and are now granting her the gracious balm of healing. We also pray for Terry that you would strengthen him physically and also spiritually, daily improve their health and make their recovery complete, that restored in body and renewed in spirit they may faithfully serve you with righteousness and goodness all the days of their life. All of this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This time our offering will be brought forward. Continue with the service of Holy Communion. We continue on the bottom of the page. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. to uh, this family of believers here. We pray that it's been a blessing for you. <laughs> I came, I looked out this morning from the sacristy and this must have been here from Sunday school yet, this door. I kind of a panic attack that Pastor Meyer was here and <laughs> left that for me so that where did, where did he go? Uh, so some reminders, our Wednesday night service this week will be in Marquette. Um, his final steps led to some Greeks. Jesus discussion with some Greeks. Um, Pastor Hildebrandt from Friesland will be our preacher. And then they're having food afterwards. So if you, if you come to that, we hope you can stay after and enjoy that fellowship and that food. Next Sunday, the Palm Sunday. So the Sunday school kids will be presenting um, the Palm Sunday message for us in song and words. So we hope you can join us for that. And so then we're in a Holy Week. A week from this week here. Um, no Bible class on Tuesday. Choirs move to Wednesday. Um, I thought there was something else here. Oh, just the Holy Week services there. Even though Easter is the second Sunday of the month, we're not going to have communion on Easter Sunday, but we will have it on Thursday and Friday. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. Um, so Kelsey had her gallbladder taken out on Thursday, I guess it was. Is home and recovering. We're thankful for that. <laughs> 